Hello and welcome to this edition of the France 24 interview. I'm Jessica Le Mazurier and my guest today is Brittany Kaiser, a former employee of the British political consultancy firm Cambridge Analytica. The firm is, of course, now notorious for its involvement in the election of Donald Trump and in the Brexit campaign. She's just released a memoir about her time working for Cambridge Analytica. Brittany's book is called Targeted. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Brittany, you worked for some three and a half years for Cambridge Analytica. Then you decided to speak out about your time there. Can you tell us what exactly Cambridge Analytica did with the information of up to uh, 87 million Facebook users in order to manipulate them in the lead up to the election of Donald Trump? Cambridge Analytica was one of many companies that in the political realm was buying and licensing as much data as you can possibly get on US citizens. And unfortunately, that's quite a lot. We don't have laws and regulations that allow us to know how much data is being collected about us, what companies hold, nor what they're going to use it for. And unfortunately, unfortunately what I saw at the end of the Trump campaign was that Data had been used in order to predict people's behavior so that individuals could be manipulated. And I say manipulated instead of persuaded because not everyone was persuaded to sign up to vote and come to the polls and care about politics and engage in important issues. Some people were unfortunately persuaded to not go to the polls and to inherently have a distrust in politics. How did Cambridge Analytica use psyops or psychological operations? This is essentially a, a form of modern day warfare. Psychological operations means that you use behavioral science in order to understand how people make their decisions, how they can be persuaded. And that was Cambridge Analytica's strategy. So what they did was work with behavioral, clinical, and experimental psychologists in order to put together surveys that tested how people saw the world, how they made their decisions every day. And when you have that type of information, you can target specific communications just all the way down to an individual or to specific groups of people that quote unquote change their behavior or convince them to take an action that they might have not taken without that ad. And they divided people up into different groups, but the group that they focused on was the neurotics. Can you explain who they are and why they decided it functioned best to uh, manipulate those particular personality types? Yeah, so there are a lot of different personality types, but when somebody is neurotic, it means that you are persuaded by fear-based messaging. And when Cambridge Analytica, the Trump campaign, and the main Trump super PAC, Make America Number One, was undertaking their testing, they saw that the most successful use cases of psychological data was to use fear-based messaging and send that to people who are neurotic, people that are emotionally unstable, people who might easily make snap decisions. And that was so successful that they continued to use the rest of the campaign budget, especially for the super PAC, on negative messaging only. Can you give me clear examples of the types of ads that were sent to these people to target them uh, on their Facebook accounts? Yes. So one of the examples that I was shown by my colleagues that ran the Trump campaign and the Trump super PAC was how they used a group called deterrents. This was a, a group that was labeled to deter them from voting. These were people that were shown to be Hillary Clinton supporters that would never vote for Donald Trump. So the only way to spend money in order to talk to these people was to decide to make them disengage from the political process. And one of the examples that I was shown was a misquote from Michelle Obama in 2007, where she was saying, Barack and I are spending a lot of time with Sasha and Malia, with our daughters, taking care of our family while we're out on the campaign trail. And she said, if you can't run your own house, you can't run the White House. Now, that was taken out of context and spliced with other pieces of information about Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky in order to make it seem like Michelle Obama was saying that Hillary Clinton could not take care of her own marital relationship and therefore she couldn't run the White House. And this was sent to conservative women where family values were considered their number one issue. And this was made to turn them off from Hillary Clinton, who all of their data said that they were going to support her and make them think less of her. 
So they used a form of advertising that was basically fear-based. It promoted sexism, racism, all those sorts of things. And disinformation. And disinformation. Uh, at what point did you start to question how ethical all of this was? Why didn't you take action further earlier on and speak out? Why did it take you so long? I wish that I would have come out earlier. I wish that I would have actually seen all of those ads and blown the whistle before election day. I was shown one month after the election by everybody that ran the campaign in the super PAC everything that they did. It was a two day long, what they called a debriefing. And for eight hours each day, they showed us all the data that they collected, how they divided people up, how they were targeted, and examples of the messaging that they used. And that was the first time that everybody that didn't work on the campaigns saw really the bare bones of what was going on behind the scenes. I wish I would have known earlier, and I wish I would have done something. But it's never too late to do the right thing. You were a Democrat, but yet you ended up working for some of the most powerful people from the far right in the United States. Ultimately, yes. how did that happen? In a sense, were you targeted? That's really why I have 400 pages of a book to explain what happened. I want everyone to know that everybody's vulnerable to being persuaded. Everybody can be targeted. If it happened to me, it could happen to anybody. And it really does on a day-to-day -day basis. We are not protected today from anything that happened in 2016. In your book, your narrator's voice almost feels at times perhaps schizophrenic. I feel like you're both extremely smart and savvy, but then at the same time you portray yourself as someone naive and who is in a way a victim who is used. Who is Brittany Kaiser? I mean, it's hard to quantify what happened. All I can explain is what I experience on a day-to-day -day basis and the way that I view all of that now. I think it's important for people to understand how vulnerable they are. I'm sure there's a lot of really amazing people at Facebook right now that think that moving fast and breaking things was great. And now they're questioning some of the decisions that Mark Zuckerberg is making, decisions that don't protect our democracy. And I bet you they never thought they would be in that position. So it's important for people, as soon as they see something going wrong in their company, to actually start to question it. Tell us about the role that you played uh, in the Brexit referendum. So Cambridge Analytica was working with LeeVU for a period of time in order to start to analyze data to figure out who in the United Kingdom would be persuaded to vote to leave. And this was an initial piece of data work using UK Independence Party data and a survey that asked people about why they would want to leave or not. And Cambridge Analytica found quite a few different groups of people who would be interested in voting to leave and identified those people, talked about their psychographics and what type of messaging would persuade them. And then that was delivered to Levi Yu, which whether they used that knowledge fully or not, they created their own data company in order to have a full national campaign that, as we know now, used disinformation, abused data laws, and even contravened uh, electoral spending regulations. The United Kingdom was really, their democracy was sold to the highest bidder. And unfortunately, that highest bidder was Aaron Banks. There's another very interesting episode in the book where you talk about your journey to Paris to pitch to the Sarkozy uh, team in 2015. I believe it's September 2015. You head there, mm -hmm. you make your pitch, but the French say, no. It was the first time that anyone had told Alexander Nix no, I think, in his entire life. We made this presentation, or Alexander makes the presentation, and you could see the looks on their face that they were shocked at the amount of data that's actually available, not just on Americans, but on French citizens, and what could be done, even under French law, in order to run these data-driven campaigns and elections. And they said, you know what? We don't want to have anything to do with this. We personally believe that no matter how effective your campaigning is, if the French people found out that we were using their data in this way to talk to them about politics, that campaign would lose just because of that information. And why, why is that, do you think? I think there's a completely different culture in most European countries than in America, where people know how bad it can get when data is abused. 
again, that's why Germany has the strictest data laws because of what happened in World War II. National registries of people's personal data were used in order to commit atrocities in the Holocaust. And so that legacy of what happened when governments abused data means that the laws and regulations in Europe really do protect citizens in a different way. Cambridge Analytica is defunct, mm -hmm. yet there are many other new or pre-existing, perhaps, Cambridge Analytica is out there, companies doing exactly the same thing. Right now, we are not any more protected than we were in 2016. In fact, I think people are probably more vulnerable this year for the 2020 elections. Now there's probably many different Cambridge Analyticas, not just in the United States, but all over the world. People understand more how to use advanced data science and micro-targeting. And Mark Zuckerberg has decided that Facebook is not going to moderate political speech. Anything that comes out of a politician's mouth is now newsworthy, and therefore they're not going to be held to the same community standards as you and I. I am not allowed to go on Facebook and incite racism or sexism, that type of discrimination. I'm not allowed to use voter suppression tactics. Our laws say that. <laughs> but somehow politicians are not being held to those standards, and I think that's so dangerous, and that Facebook has created the biggest threat to our democracy this year than we could have imagined. How can people stop themselves from being manipulated? How can people stop their data being stolen or taken without them knowing? Should everyone just leave Facebook, uh, put their phones away when they don't want anyone to know where they've been? I don't know, stop using it. How can they stop leaving this trail of data everywhere? I think the first step is to become digitally literate. Understand how much data you produce every day. How about read the terms and conditions before you download your next app? You know, if we want to use a lot of apps and technology platforms, we actually have to give our data away. Hopefully that's going to change. We're going to have more transparency into what data we are producing, who it's being shared with, and for what purposes our data is going to be used, and have the option to opt out. Would you say that our democracy is under threat with the way that information is being used against us? Absolutely. Our democracy is under threat. And until we have big tech understand that, and invest in the solution, we're still going to be vulnerable, especially in election years. Brittany Kaiser, thank you very much for joining us here on France 24. You've been watching the France 24 interview.